Hello, good evening and welcome to another meeting of the Libertarian Alliance. Peripatetic. Um, and tonight's speaker is David... McDonough. McDonough. <laughs> still! Yes, that's all And he's just. speaking on reviewing and criticising uh, the crowds. The Madness of Crowds by, by Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray. Oh, thank you, Bob. You're very kind. Um, so uh, I suppose I might start off by uh, reading this wretched passage towards the end, uh, because this will base a lot of my, uh, the main blocks, I suppose, of what I've got to say by way of criticism later on, but I'll try and give an account of what he says in the book before I do that. Uh, that's not the passage. Uh, There's a ticket. Oh, yeah, but that's... Uh, I did, uh, I've marked it out, but I, uh, that's the, uh, that's, uh, that passage I saw was very, uh, as the overclass. But anyhow, towards the end of the book, he, he does say something like, uh, and I quote, I'm going to try and get the actual passage, but perhaps I won't be able to get it. Uh, no, I've marked it out, but I, 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 uh, I should have spent a bit. Uh, I'll, I'll just give the gist of what he says. Basically, he, um, he call, he's mainly talking about the madness of crowds. He's mainly talking about a new ideology or a new religion. He doesn't like the word political correctness, number than Bob does. And he, as far as I can see, he doesn't use it once throughout the book. Uh, but this was this would be the, uh, the uh, term that I give to this new ideology, uh, and uh, towards the end of the book, not throughout it, but towards the end of the book, in the passage in the last few pages, which I, I probably did overlook just then, uh, but I did mark it out with a pencil, but I still overlooked it somehow. Uh, he says, uh, modern liberalism has uh, come to uh, a bit of a mess, and uh, he, he, what he does is he. Uh, identifies or conflates uh, what I would call political correctness with liberalism. Now, um, my main thesis of the talk will be that they're polar opposites. Uh, liberalism is for uh, tolerance of free speech and uh, uh, it's not going to make too much of fuss, so it's going to be loose, lax, not going to make too much of fuss about differences and so on, things like this. Uh, live and let live. Whereas political correctness is very opposite. Everyone is assigned a complete place by their identity. You have these various identities. Each one of them has to be treated as special. Uh, and anyone who uh, criticizes this, uh, then they're, they're punished in some way or other by losing their jobs or by being boycotted. Uh, political correctness looks at who you associate with. Now, liberalism wouldn't mind who you associate with. Uh, you know, the uh, proper uh, liberal reaction to uh, when fascism arose which, by the by, did arise from Marxism, disappointed Marxism, uh, not uh, from anywhere else. But the proper response to it, from a liberal point of view, is not to be frightened of being associated with fascists, or wherever they are, but to actually talk to them and argue with them, uh, just like you talk and argue with anyone else. In other words, liberalism doesn't stigmatise. Uh, political correctness specialises in stigmatising they are, as far as I can see, polar opposites. So, so it's a pity I didn't find that passage to read it out, but um, that will be my main interest. But first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll outline uh, what he says in the book. Now, he doesn't like this term political correctness, so he doesn't use it. He uses madness, he uses ideology, he uses new religion, these sort of things. To, uh, all these things are sort of apt to talk about the movement. Uh, that has been going for a long time, actually, but he thinks it's really only got underway, and really, he holds um, the common sense view of political correctness, that it is basically good, but it's overstepped the mark. And uh, he thinks it's only really overstepped the mark with a vengeance uh, since the financial disaster of uh, uh, 2008. So he thinks it's only in the last 10 years or so, 12 years or so now, uh, that um, it's really become problematic. Uh, now, of course, it can be traced back uh, what we now call 
this new science or I call it political correctness, but he calls it the madness, this madness, can be traced back a long, quite a long time. Um, however, it did have certain boosts. And uh, one of the boosts was certainly the 2008 boost. But it's had setbacks and boosts along the way. Uh, a massive boost for it was in, uh, uh, was in 1969 when uh, Mark Huser and Angela Davis uh, had the idea that the uh, working class had failed. Uh, they'd be too apathetic. They hadn't uh, found their class interests. And so therefore, they were no good as a movement towards communism. So therefore, what about these active different groups? Uh, you could have, have these different groups instead, and they might well do the job. Uh, Mark Uther did think that communism was quite possible, and so they might do the job of pushing society towards communism. Um, so that was a big boost. Um, and uh, in fact, that was reflected in the Communist Party, uh, whereas a magazine, Marxism Today, was started up by uh, b uh, people in the Communist Party, just come out of the Young Communist League, uh, which were more or less in their 20s, and they opposed the traditional Morning Star, which was mainly written by people, I suppose, uh, in their 60s, but also, you know, some younger people, some in, go, going down into their 20s. But anyway, uh, the traditional Marxism was maintained, or the traditional Bolshevism, traditional Leninism, was maintained in the Communist Party by uh, the old guard, the Morning Star, and the new guard more or less got rid of the working class and was having a look at these new groups of the dispossessed and the single uh, parent families and so on. Uh, uh, the people who are crippled and so on, uh, various minority groups, uh, uh, press groups and so on, and they might do the job uh, uh, for them uh, of pushing forward towards communism. But of course, uh, the uh, Mises quite rightly points out the reasons why communism isn't uh, particularly an option. He points out the economic calculation argument, which points out why communism isn't particularly an option. Mm. But anyway, he went on, this, this movement went on, and uh, as I say, Douglas Murray thinks that it really got, got underway in 2008. So he's, he opens, uh, uh, Douglas Murray himself is uh, uh, opposed, he, well, he is a, a gay man, and uh, he opens up with uh, his first chapter on gayness, and he um, says that uh, he also not only a gay, he's also a conservative, or, or he, he, well, he doesn't like labels so much, but he's basically conservative-minded. He's not left. He's uh, uh, he's conservative. He likes the Conservative Party a bit better than the Labour Party, and so on. And um, he uh, thought for a long, long time that, that, that uh, there was a split in uh, the gay movement between most the majority of people and uh, a minority of people who were more inclined towards uh, uh, the left wing. And the minority of people uh, in, in this book calls queers, and they, he thinks they, they themselves call them queers, as opposed to gays, so he has a, a section of gays versus queers. And he says they don't really like each other, these two people. Uh, the queers gets on the gays' nerves, so he says. And now he's been, a, this is his own distinction, so uh, he's been a bit, uh, I suppose, uh, innovative here. Uh, so he may well, uh, you know, the, this is probably his personal impression, although he's, uh, you know, he's, I think he's in his 40s now, so he, he's had a, a few years to think this over. He's been homosexual all his life, and, he, 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 and he's uh, grown up being perfectly all right to be an homosexual. Um, so uh, he probably had a lot of experience. And uh, from this experience, he thinks that there are these two groups, uh, the queers and uh, the gays, and they don't like each other. And uh, he says the queers want to join uh, conventional society, uh, but the, uh, sorry, the gays want to join conventional society, but the queers uh, want to ruin it, want to uh, dismantle it. Uh, and he says, uh, because of this, the, the majority of guys don't like queers because they think they're too disruptive they, and, they, and they're more or less messing things up for them. Uh, they want to live a quiet life. Whereas the guys want anything but a quiet life. So while he's still on the topic of guys, he says there's a radical distinction. Oh, thanks, Pat. There's a radical distinction between uh, lesbians and uh, gay men. He says they usually don't like each other. Um, 
uh, gay men tend to think that lesbians are dowdy and uh, dull. Uh, lesbians tend to think that uh, gay men haven't properly grown up. He said, well, anyway, they don't associate very uh, with each other uh, socially or in, in community activities. Um, and uh, so he's, uh, he's more or less spilling the beans here from the insider point of view, as it were, whether he's right or nothing, Bob might have a few things to say on this uh, or others. But uh, anyhow, this is, what he, this is what he says. And uh, so, so then he, he comes on to uh, women. And um, he um, the, the talks about uh, the, uh, how... Uh, Feminists uh, have uh, gone towards uh, a crazy uh, aspect of being completely you know, the radical feminists. You know, I mean, it doesn't actually reproduce his uh, majority and minority thing when he does with the guys of, of fuyas and uh, guys. Uh, but he, uh, he doesn't explicitly reproduce this, but he does more or less reproduce it in saying that there are a minority of feminists which are absolutely anti-men to uh, an, an insane degree. Uh, and they, they have things like kill all men and so on and so forth, which they think is, uh, uh, fits the bill. Uh, uh, but of course, this, is, this he says, is, is dysfunctional, it's insane, it's, de uh, it's deranged, he thinks. Uh, and uh, so he thinks that they are, uh, you know, non-starters, uh, and they're, they're absolutely. Uh, and he thinks that whilst he has a look at the, the fact that they arose in the in the sixties, the, the original um, uh, feminists, he says, in the eighteenth century, people like Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, of course, Mary Wollstonecraft was a liberal, uh, and she uh, um, she wrote two replies to uh, Edmund Burke's reflections on the French Revolution. Uh, most of the, there's 54 replies to Edmund Burke's uh, uh, reflections on the French Revolution. Most of them were called The Rights of Man. Tom Paine's was, of course, The Rights of Man, but also Joseph Priestley wrote a book, The Rights of Man, and Mary Wollstonecraft wrote a book called The Rights of Man. <laughs> there were a few Rights of Men in among these 54 replies, because, I mean, they didn't, they probably didn't realise that other people were going to choose that title. Um, but anyhow, she wrote a second book, which she's better known for, the rights of women. <laughs> well, and uh, of course, there are people, most, uh, I've, I've met many feminists throughout, they don't even know that she wrote a book called The Rights of Man. And in fact, some of them said she wouldn't do such a thing because <laughs> they, they paint. A lot of people, I've noticed this, uh, I once gave a talk on Joseph Priestley and there was this very uh, intelligent Unitarian woman who was uh, a regular attendant at Unitarian chapels in Birmingham. And uh, because she uh, knew a lot about modern Unitarianism, which is basically atheistic, uh, or half atheistic now, you know, most of them say they don't believe in Christianity at all, uh, she thought that Unitarianism in the 18th century was like that. But of course, Unitarianism in the 18th century was far more Orthodox Christian than that. And Priestley himself was, uh, he wasn't a complete Orthodox Christian, uh, but he was, he did believe in Jesus, you know, that Jesus was the Son of God and so on, you know, the, the, the actual thing. Uh, no, he didn't believe that Jesus was son of God. He did believe that Jesus existed and he was a, uh, that he performed certain miracles uh, and so on. He believed most of the stories. He I made a mistake then when I said he believed he was the son of God. He didn't believe that. He thought there was one God uh, and the Trinity was nonsense. So, but uh, nevertheless, he did have a robust sort of version of Christianity, whereas this lady uh, thought that um, he didn't have such a... because being a Unitarian, he couldn't have had such a... he was probably an atheist. <laughs> or, he, uh, and, or he had a very light version of Christian. And the feminists are exactly the same with Wollstonecraft. They think that Wollstonecraft's like her, as they are. Uh, but um, she's not. She's, uh, she's a liberal, in fact. And she just wants uh, things which now almost anyone would grant, you know, like uh, the rights of women to take out mortgages and things like that. You know, more or less uh, m women having the same sort of rights as men. Uh, this is what Wollstonecraft uh, advocated, but of course they didn't have that in the 18th, in the 20th century, <laughs> and uh, never mind the, the 18th century. But uh, uh, so, uh, so many, uh, uh, so many, uh, uh, these these feminists, uh, they think that uh, these radical feminists uh, uh, go way back. But of course, as Douglas Murray says, the uh, right up till the 1960s, 
But they were in the Wollstonecraft type tradition. They were uh, making moderate claims and uh, uh, you know, were trying to fit into society like everyone else. Uh, and it's only since they've got more, uh, the minority of them have got more radical. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, so in, th in that sense, they are like, like he says, the prayers are, there's a minority of them who are radical and uh, are not going to fit into society uh, uh, at all. And so um, then he comes to um, Rice and he thinks that um, Martin Luther King got it right, that uh, we should uh, judge people by their character rather than by their skin colour. But he reckons that the new madness, the new religion, has gone the opposite, that they don't care about at all about character, but they're absolutely obsessed with skin colour. Uh, and uh, they uh, talk about uh, you know, uh, various things of uh, adopting people on skin colour and so on and making different identities relating to skin colour and so on. Uh, and they, they don't care about character. So he thinks they've reversed uh, what Martin Luther King said, and completely reversed it. Uh, so, um, on, so basically, uh, then he goes on to what is, uh, he then goes on to intersectionism. And he says, he says a bit what I've just said earlier on, that Mark Hughes introduced, except he, he, uh, he hardly, yes, hardly mentions uh, Marx from today as well, in the, uh, which is the English uh, uh, Communist Party's uh, journal, uh, which now, of course, is you know, the people who run it a bit older. But he mentions two, two people um, who, who start up suggesting that uh, intersectionalism, uh, that is the various uh, groups, the various groups who have a grievance, uh, may have a common cause and they may force on communism to do a better job than the working class. Now he mentions these two, this particular paper uh, by two authors um, and uh, he mentions this in, in the 1980s. Well, of course, exactly the same thesis was put forward when the magazine was first started around about 1969 or so. Uh, uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't seem to be aware of this. Uh, but nevertheless, they are going to now. They are going to try to push forward uh, this thing. Now he has a look at this, and he, he notices that these groups um, don't have anything in common, and in fact that their their interests clash with each other. Uh, and in this, he's absolutely right. Uh, but of course, this is exactly the same fault um, as uh, Marx made with the working class. See, Marx had the idea that um, the working class had an economic interest and, uh, and that it was in their interest uh, uh, within the bourgeois society, which he called, you know, he called capitalist society, the bourgeois society, it was in their interest uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, gather together. He thought that the trade unions uh, pushed forward the working class interest and uh, eventually it would be in their interest to introduce communism. Well, of course, Mises, as I said earlier on, refuted that with the economic calculation argument, uh, oddly enough an argument that Marx himself used against those he called utopian socialists, which were just socialists who didn't have uh, his materialist interpretation of history, or his materialist conception of history, and didn't have the idea at the time. Uh, they thought that uh, we could have the utopian socialists, like Robert Owen, thought we could have a, a socialism by mere agreement, whereas Marx thought that uh, you'd have to wait for the time uh, when the time was ripe for socialism. Now, this doesn't have much substance to it, but Marx thought it did. He, in fact, he called it scientific socialist socialism and he called the uh, Owen a uh, uh, utopian socialist. I think anyone uh, with science in mind, although Owen is extremely moralistic, nevertheless in his writings, but anyone with science in mind, looking at Marx and Owen, uh, would think that Owen was more scientific than Marx because Owen is at least willing to try things out whereas Marx is waiting for the right time and the right time is uh, something that can't really be testable um, uh, it's less testable than you know, the, uh, Owen's the, uh, experiment in New Harmony was for example um, but anyhow Owen uh, and Marx ignores in fact well, Marx, Marx actually attacks uh, a person called Weston who um, uh, said the trade unions were no good and they were anti-working class organisations, which is of course what Owen said in the 1830s. 
and Weston says it as well, he repeats Owen, and Marx attacks this, but he doesn't attack it very well. Uh, basically what Marx says is this, uh, and it, in fact this is about the only thing that Marx says is in the, uh, where the, the, there is a class, a co contest of, of, of class interest. Marx says that if um, wages rise, that can eat into profits, that's perfectly true. And he says this is quite possible, the trade unions can get higher wages, can, in some circumstances, win higher wages, which is also perfectly true. Um, but the, here we have uh, Marx's idea of, class, uh, of the class conflict. In wage bargaining, uh, you can have either be, uh, have higher wages or lower wages. Uh, that's perfectly true. However, the, the whole of the bargain will be uh, within a zone of what economists would call a positive sum game. The bargaining, of course, will be zero sum. You know, one side will lose and the other side will win. Uh, but within the whole of the uh, trading transaction, there will be what the economists would call a, a consumer surplus on the one side and a producer surplus on the other. And neither side will settle unless it's within that zone. In other words, the, bar the wage bargaining is always within a zone. Uh, and either point along the well, it's, it's one side, it is in one side's interest to settle nearer there so they get more money for themselves. Nevertheless, neither side will go over the other side, completely over the other side. If wages are too low, the, the workers won't work. If, 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 if uh, wages are too high and the, and the project that uh, the, you're being employed to, to do uh, will not pay for it, then the project won't go ahead. So it has to settle within the positive side, uh, the uh, negative sum game, the pocket negative sum game is the wage bargaining itself. The wage bargaining will fall always within the positive sum game. So Marx's sole example of class struggle, of uh, the clash of economic interests, is in fact the counter example. Because every instance that he says is actually an example of a positive sum game, which of course is of mutual interests. Uh, so therefore then, Marx actually unwittingly argues that there's no class struggle in society and there's no clash of interest in society but the interests are in common uh, but this he, he tends to overlook because he, you know, he doesn't read his own work uh, clearly enough but so I mean so in, so in this sense Marx himself and this is the reason why Mark User and uh, Angela Davis was uh, uh, disappointed these workers didn't find their economic interests because there wasn't any economic interest for them to find now with intersectionism these various groups Dr. Smurray quite rightly points out, they've got no common interest either. So they won't find any. Now, Douglas Murray uh, hints at this revolutionary thing in his opening, in the opening chapter, uh, but then he, 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 he brings it up again in his chapter on Marxism, you know, where he deals with this quite well. Uh, but apart from that, he drops it because, because it isn't a big feature of what, what I call political correctness or what he calls the new religion or the, uh, or the, the madness. Uh, and um, uh, it isn't a common, you know, the common, you know, most people who indulge in political correctness don't know anything about this communism business or, or progress towards a new society. Uh, most political correct people, uh, do, uh, even the strict didalogues, don't think that it, political correctness is going to solve all problems. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, now, there is a sense in which when Murray is commentating on some of these things, he notices that they go over the mark. Uh, for example, he notices they're not making uh, relations better, but they're making relations worse. Now, in a sense, with certain people, what he calls the queers, he knows that this is the object of the queers to be disruptive, or it's the object of the, the very radical feminists, not all feminists, but the radical feminists, who are a bit like the, what he calls the queers, uh, to disrupt. But it isn't the object of the average feminist to disrupt, or the average homosexual, according to him, anyway, uh, to disrupt society. They want to fit in. Now, political correctness as a whole wants to fit in, but he notices in, in, in many places throughout these books that they are not quite doing it. It doesn't dawn on him that's the object of political correctness, that political correctness, as I call it, is persecution, not making things better. It is the joy of, uh, of uh, causing trouble and, and, and the joy of, of pestering and, and, and the joy of being superior and, uh, and attacking people, he doesn't, he doesn't notice that at all. Uh, but uh, he, he, that would make sense of when they overstepped the line. Uh, so, um, 
I think I'm... Bob doesn't agree with me. <laughs> but, uh, um, Pardon? I think you just have to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's well, it's of course, I might be wrong. <laughs> uh, but but uh, anyhow, it's, it's what I... Um, so um, then he goes on to intersexualism. Now, intersexualism is, he says this, intersex... Uh, sorry, uh, then he goes on to... Uh, I've forgotten the wretched word. It's, it's not intersexualism. There is a word for it, and I've, I've forgotten the wretched word. I beg your pardon. I've forgotten this. Uh, uh, he goes on to trans, that's right. And trans is, of course, the worst thing... Uh, uh, trans is where uh, uh, certain people. Uh, we had one in the libertarian movement called uh, I forget uh, the male name. I think it's Donald, wasn't it? It's Donald. Uh, yeah, oh, McCluskey. Yeah, Donald, yeah. Donald McCluskey, yeah, and then it became yeah, Derby yeah, McCluskey. Yeah, it's now Derby. Yeah. Yeah. She's a, and uh, there is, of course, uh, another. Uh, we don't know whether she's right, yeah. another another person who started off as a uh, man and now writes as a woman called uh, James Morris and Jan Morris, oh, yes. and uh, both these writers are are excellent writers. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think both uh, Derby, whenever she writes it or he writes, I don't know whether it's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for my. I couldn't give a damn whether he's a man or a woman. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference to me at all. Mm. But anyway, they are excellent authors, um, uh, and. Um, uh, as I might rudely really add here, Tolstoy did say that women over a certain age are of no sex anyway. <laughs> and uh, what well, he had that's a certain age, I don't know. But it was, it was, I'm afraid it probably was a bit too low. But anyhow, what he meant is that w women have to be young in order to be sexually exciting. That's what Tolstoy said. But anyway, uh, it, it is true for, for many men. Um, uh, so. Um, uh, so Derdry, uh, she writes very well, or uh, or he writes very well. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter which it is. But and uh, Jan also writes very well. Or J James, uh, or both the books as James and the books as uh, Donald. I think were, were, yeah, the early books are worth reading as well. They're good authors. Uh, now he does give a, a, a biography of uh, of James going into Jan in the book, and uh, he he uh, he's written uh, a book about it. And uh, his ordeal, and of course, it, it takes a lot of order now to take these various uh, drugs and so on to uh, calm their uh, testosterone and so on. And then eventually, of course, they have to have their uh, penis amplicated and so on. And, uh, and amplicated? Uh, is amplicated the right word? <laughs> Taken off? Make, make it bigger? <laughs> oh, oh uh, <laughs> what is the word? Amputated. Oh, amputated. Amputated, yes, my mistake. <laughs> Malapropism. <laughs> My mistake. Uh, they also have to be castrated. <laughs> yes, they also have to be castrated. Yes. And so, and all this is uh, not not uh, doesn't strike me as being good fun. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, uh, nevertheless, they're willing to go through it, and they don't regret it. Uh, and and so um, so the, there are certain cases where you get these people. However. Uh, uh, that's uh, they they, uh, they were chaps, who, very intelligent chaps, uh, James and Donald to begin with, uh, very intelligent chaps who knew what they were doing and uh, were willing to pay the price both uh, emotionally and in in money uh, to have the thing done. But what you've got just re recently uh, in the last fifteen years, I suppose, is you've got children, some of them as young as five, saying they don't quite fit in the same body. And, uh, and the medical people. Now, uh, I did raise this with, uh, me and Bob raised this yesterday with another of our friends, David, who, who doubted, you see, David had the idea that uh, it was probably the parents who instigated this rather than the uh, medical profession. But anyway, what you do have is uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of children saying that they are of, uh, should really be of the other sex, and the establishment, the National Health Service in the UK, taking action on this and actually giving them all sorts of hormones from a, uh, an early age and eventually when they get to be about 16 or 17 actually changing their sex and of course this uh, uh, Douglas Murray uh, points out a, no a number of stories where people do change their minds and some of the people, who one chap who, who he writes about uh, who changed his mind uh, changed his mind when a lot of the damage had been done and he became infertile, he was, he was going from male to female. He became infertile anyway, 
and the net result, even though he changed his mind, he thought he was making a mistake. Uh, the result was, after all these people, that he was infertile anyway, so uh, this wasn't a uh, you know, good, uh, you know, good outcome. But anyway, he, he's glad that he was thought about it and changed his mind in time. And it, uh, so, Douglas Murray, in the early in the, in the early part of the book, um, recites a uh, uh, you know John uh, Iran said he was a doctor, but not a medical doctor. Uh, there, there's a, a, a doctor of education called. Um, uh, Dr. Michael Davidson, and um, he was uh, was uh, part of uh, the gay movement when he was very young, in his teens, but he left, and uh, he got married, uh, and he's been 35 years married, and he got about three or four children, uh, but then he became a Christian, and he became a fundamentalist Christian, it often happens, I, I did know a person who was... Uh, a Catholic and uh, was converted by the Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, he had ten children and he went home to his wife and says Catholics aren't really Christians and we're not really married and he walked out walked out of his wife and ten children <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was a chap we, I knew in the West Midlands but, but the, the, this chap uh, became a fundamentalist Christian and made films trying to convert uh, uh, trying to spread a cure for homosexuality now uh, he made a particular film of this and the gay uh, movement was persecuting him saying that he got it wrong and that he was a bigot and so on and he appeared on um, the television and uh, Piers Morgan said he was a bigot and he'd pay for his uh, as Douglas Murray says he paid for his fares to go along to the uh, television studio uh, but then he told him to shut up <laughs> as soon as he got there Piers Morgan uh, he said now why he says it is true isn't it that you, you think that uh, homosexuality can be cured and he says yes he says it can you know, with, uh, in fact, uh, he says shut up you bigots <laughs> and, don't, and got him out and uh, Murray thought this was a bit like, bizarre so Murray went along to this film to have a look at it and he, he thought it was pretty disappointing he thought it wasn't up to much uh, and um he, uh, but he then, uh, uh, he, he, but at the end of all this, he did, he did say uh, there's um, a situation with both the trans thing and the uh, uh, homosexual thing, whether we're born homosexuals or whether we are converted by n nature. Now, uh, earlier on, this was hazy, you know, right, say in the early 1960s, many people were confused about this. Mrs. Thatcher was, uh, to some extent, confused about this when she had a section 28 wasn't it in the early 1980s and there was a big fuss about homosexuality being spread in the schools and so on and there was some sort of uh, but anyway there's, there's been a lot but in the last 20 years or so most people have taken homosexual sexuality to be hardwired uh, hardware part of the hardware he has this thing between our computer and onto with computer's hardware and software so the uh, uh, the homosexuality has been taken to be hardware but Murray himself uh, tends, tends to think that this is that it might not be the case in every case uh, that uh, it, it might well be that uh, there are many people classified as homosexuals that are happy as homosexuals who might have a choice have an actual choice in this and they could become heterosexuals if they wanted to and there's others who are uh, you know like like many heterosexuals who you know, can for for the life of them, go uh, uh, practice homosexuality. Uh, you know, so, you know, so, so I suppose this, this is. I suppose there could be a gradient. We know there is a gradient between the sexes, don't we? We know that there are some feminine men and masculine women, that sort of thing. So, so, you know, uh, so Murray actually raises this question in his homosexual chapter that uh, it might it might not be all hardware, uh, but he, he has a look at the hardware. Thing. Of course, he's much better. Uh, if it is a matter of hardware, and Murray actually does say this, which I think is actually false, well, it's part of common sense. If uh, we're born in a certain way, then it is uh, cruel to pick on us for that for those traits that we're born with, uh, and uh, and it's uh, and we, we morals must have uh, a certain amount of choice. Now, um, I think that this is not this is not true. Uh, 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 you know, and, uh, the the whole concept, of, the old Christian concept of sin is against it. You know, uh, the Christians say, uh, and I think the Christians are, 
are probably right on. I mean, Christianity hasn't got much going for it, but I think they're right on this. If if we are bound to sin, which we are according to Christianity, then we can, we still condemn sin, even though we're bound to do it. So and I think the Christians are right on that. So, uh, but ne- nevertheless, Murray actually does say, and Murray doesn't question this obvious question. Perhaps I shouldn't have done. But anyway, uh, Murray says uh, the hardware. If it is hardware, it's not. It's not. Uh, uh, right to uh, condemn it morally, you've got to accept it, and certainly uh, uh, I, I think almost anyone, certainly someone with, uh, who, who doubts this, would still think that uh, it would be a bit silly to question something which is hardware that we're born with. Uh, but money does say that if there was a homosexual gene, he wouldn't care. Uh, he wouldn't care whether there was one or if there wasn't one. Uh, he'd still be. he still whether it's nature or nurture. In his case, he's still satisfied with how he is. Which is as a uh, gay man, and so um, you know uh, he's, he's more or less indifferent to that. Uh, so he says, and he's probably you know, he's probably being sincere there. Uh, so um, uh, so yeah. So uh, there is this hardware now. There is this thing uh, also in uh, whether there's a, wo- a woman or a man in hardware and and, and software. Uh, it, it, until recently, it was considered completely hardware, but now the trans thing are of course trying to make it into something software. Now, what he says in this is that the trans thing in this are uh, attacking uh, feminism. And of course they are. I mean, they're, they're, we know. <laughs> even this week, even today, I think, in the, in the newspapers, there have been people like Suzanne Moore, who uh, is being attacked by the, uh, by the Labour, it's by the two Labour leaders, actually, the two girls who are now uh, in the Labour, Labour movement for this uh, woman with a double barrel name. What's she doing there? They party with double barrel name, I don't know. She, uh, she, she took her husband's surname and I didn't know. Oh, well, she married up, I suppose, yeah. Uh, what's her name? No, no, she's Long, Long, long Bailey, Bailey, but her name's Long and her husband's Bailey. Oh, she I see, did, oh. did the PC thing. And oh, they, oh, they've done it. Oh, that's a PC thing. Yeah. It used to be an upper class thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a PC thing now. Oh, no. oh that's good. <laughs> So this is it. This is PC achieving class mobility. <laughs> <laughs> and your conclusion, David? Is <laughs> oh, uh, my conclusion. Well, I was to Bob what's the conclusion. My conclusion is that uh, Murray, like many other people, do confuse liberalism with political correctness, but they're polar opposites, which I said at the beginning. And uh, I don't think uh, you know whilst uh, liberalism is tolerant of political correctness, just like it's tolerant of anything. Uh, nevertheless. It is not politically correct. And when um, an organisation like Fair Trade or uh, uh, Political Correctness or anything else, whilst it makes propaganda, that's perfectly liberal. But if it actually has laws, uh, then it becomes illiberal. Now, the current laws on uh, discrimination, I think, are de facto uh, privileges. Now, they're uh, uh, de jure uh, equal laws. Uh, discrimination, it means all racial discrimination but there's many uh, uh, black men who say, quite rightly in my opinion uh, that black men can't be racist. I think that's right I think that gets the spirit of the law however they've got another reason for saying it, they think that racism isn't only just discrimination on the basis of race it also comes from power, they get this from Foucault Uh, and uh, I think, uh, well, uh, Christian eulogised Foucault in one meeting. I think Foucault's idea of power is, is utterly, uh, you know, and Molly says the same, he's utterly uh, at a loss, you know, he's neither here nor there. You know, uh, but Molly does, he, Molly does think there's different forms of power, uh, as I think Foucault does. Uh, I do as well, I think there is uh, the power that Matthew Bolton was selling in Birmingham which is, which is uh, morally neutral. And uh, there's the power, political power, which they've got in Parliament. And, uh, of course, liberalism is uh, not about empowering certain groups, it's about dissolving power. Whereas I think PC is about empowering all these various groups, but buying, pa- buying power in these groups, whether they're the disabled or homosexuals or feminists or whatever they are, trans, uh, they are putting them in a privilege of, uh, in a position of privilege, really real privilege, privilege in law, and that means the law forces underprivilege. So 
political correctness poses as being for equality, but in actual fact, the whole of its movement to pass laws uh, ensures a drastic inequality. But anyway, it's got nothing whatsoever to do with the liberal idea. It's the very opposite of the liberal idea. That's my thesis. But Murray thinks that it is not only political, uh, not only is um, it a, a, a recent madness, but it's also liberalism itself that's gone a bit mad because he's conservative. So he thinks liberalism itself has gone a bit mad. I think he's confused, he's confusing liberalism and what I call political correctness, what he calls the new religion or the madness or whatever. So that's my conclusion. Well, thank you, thank you, David. Would you recommend it to read? Oh, uh, yes, I would. Oh. <laughs> uh, and uh, Phil's already got a copy. Of you. How are you finding it, Phil? Oh, it's very readable. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he writes well, I like it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's worth reading, yeah. Yeah, maybe you criticise of confusing political correctness and liberalism. Is that not just a mistake that, or it's just a, it's just a terminology that people use these days that mainly comes from America where they mean when they say liberal, they mean socialistic, and mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, the when people say liberal, it's, it's a very broad term, yeah. and uh, people use it in all kinds of ways, and not yes. always in the pristine sense. And I think oh, yes. when you're saying it, it seems to me, he's just saying it to me in the modern Twitter sphere and people talking about American politics. When they say liberal, they do yeah. mean yeah. politically correct sort of uh, yeah. things. Which, which yeah, I think that's right. perfectly right. And I think you're bound to get that sort of thing with, with almost any of these distinctions. Uh, you know, uh, use almost any word, uh, you, uh, you, you're bound to get what you might call a hazy sort of use or a precise, I mean, it's exactly the same with privilege. I, I define privilege rather, uh, uh, rather uh, in the pristine sense, rather pedantically there, but the common use of the word uh, privilege is, uh, as he uses it, because he doesn't understand about this law point. It just means advantage, any sort of advantage is privilege. So therefore, then, people can say, uh, if I, uh, I'm white and I, walk, I, I feel safe walking along the road, uh, then that might be white privilege, because uh, a black person might not feel safe. Mm -hmm. Why do they use that thing? I mean, it's ridiculous, because I'm afraid that uh, in ter terms of criminality, whites are uh, responsible for burglary, for breaking in people's houses, but for mugging, it's mainly blacks. <laughs> so people who make the street unsafe at night are usually blacks, not whites. But, you know, we know there's an overlap. The, the, uh, the occasional black might go, might burgle, and the occasional might, white might mug. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's... Uh, uh, so, uh, but, but uh, yes, uh, that is true, Paul. Um, it, it is hazy. Words are hazy, and they're used... Uh, imprecise, imprecisely, but then when uh, someone like Douglas Murray or other writers uh, blame liberalism, uh, they're not just talking in a hazy way, um, they, they are talking about the liberal ideology itself, I think. Uh, I mean, he writes as a conservative and he's talking about liberalism in general. Now, conservative, the conservatives who write about liberalism and disapprove of liberalism, they do all the time, are really disapproving of the LA's type of liberalism, because the modern liberalism from the 1870s onwards, the liberalism of, say, for example, uh, Joseph Chamberlain, who I mentioned you know, before the discussion, who, who did change from Gladstone to Chamberlain, he's, big, he's from, from, uh, from laissez-faire to the welfare state almost, in, in, in just one generation. Um, so when they're, when they're talking about the welfare state, they're really talking about their own ideology as well, as Paul Johnson is more or less... Uh, displaying now, it is not unusual for a Conservative Party to go for big spending, which is the party which has nationalised in Great Britain's history more than any other party. And it's not the Labour Party, so I almost told you which, <laughs> which one it is. Certainly, certainly not the Liberal Party, it is the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party has nationalised more than any other party. It's because it's older. When, when Gladstone was in the Conservative Party and Chancellor of the Exchequer in the Conservative Party before he converted to Liberalism, he talked openly about nationalising the railways. So it's not so something new with, with the Corbyn. <laughs> it was there in 1844 with Gladstone who talked about nationalising the railways. And he was, then he was a Tory. You know, nationalisation is a Tory paradigm. The whole, the whole socialism... You say socialism, you're talking about a new word for Toryism. 
But the Webb said, socialism is to the left of liberalism. Well, that messed up the left wing, right wing dichotomy, because before then it was the liberals on the left and the Tories on the right. But now you've got Tories on the bloody right and Tories on the left. <laughs> Of course, the Liberals just vanished. For, <laughs> for, 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 yeah, the Pristine Liberals just vanished. No, over there. Yeah, I think it's a very good point that you oppose uh, uh, liberalism and political co co correctness. As a, how I see it is that uh, liberalism, we can, uh, you, you express your, your, your ideas and then the, the, the other party express the, the opposite idea while well, it's political correctness it's just uh, uh, don't say this don't say that it's uh, censorship so it's uh, like uh, a way to impose uh, group think like in the 1984 group think yeah I mean uh, if you if you go back to the 1950s you know both left and right uh, you had nothing like what you've got now with this PC business what he calls the new religion both left and right were willing to talk and debate and argue you know, they were just, you know, things were as they should be again, you know. Uh, I think we need to get rid of this political correctness and go back to having a conversation, whatever the issues are involved, uh, tolerating the other person, not calling him names. You shouldn't be associated with him, let alone bloody argue with him. You shouldn't even bloody associate. I saw you the other night. Do you know that his great granddad was a fascist? <laughs> or his great granddad had a dream where he was a fascist? <laughs> and this associate you you're associated with this person it's absolutely silly absolutely silly and you see our freedom of association and not condemning people for associating with and associating with their political opponents then you should meet your political opponents and argue with them try to say yeah I, I think there is an ambiguity there because um what liberals, libertarians would say is that we have no obligation to associate with anybody. Oh, that's right. And, and therefore, if we don't want to talk to this crowd or that yes. crowd, then we are free not to talk to that crowd. Oh, yes. Uh, the ambiguity is reinforced uh, when it comes to university. Because again, what libertarians would say is that I have the right, if I own this pub, uh, not to allow people who I disagree with. Uh, for instance, if they are fascist, if they are gays, if they are, yeah. whatever, uh, I can say, you know, in my pub, you don't do that. Mm. Um, that is what they do at universities. So at universities, the no platform movement says, uh, we don't want to hear this crowd, we don't want to hear that crowd. Problem is, universities don't belong to anybody. I mean, they are, uh, some universities are private. Some universities are uh, owned by trust and then things like this. Um, some universities are government owned. So um, who is the owner in that case who is legitimate by, in saying uh, we don't want uh, whoever to talk, uh, to give a talk and, uh, and so on. Um, so that is where you know, a lot of confusion comes. I would be exactly like you. I would say I want to talk to everybody. And actually, I don't come to many meetings of the Libertarian Alliance, but I do come, I do go to meetings of the left because I enjoy listening to their arguments, see whether they challenge mine, and I can still have the answers to uh, what they put forward and get um, sort of uh, rebuffed uh, because I ask pointed questions to the people on the other side, which they have no answer to. But um, it's, that's me. But I f fully understand that people would say, I don't do that. I, I mean, well, of course, I mean, liberal, uh, liberal propagandists will always defend rejecting people on any sort of basis whatsoever. And uh, you will uh, also defend people's right to take drugs, people's right to take suicide and so on. Any number of things that he'll defend uh, uh, as part of uh, social liberty. However, the propagandist himself, as a propagandist, uh, will not uh, uh, will not dismiss a Nazi or a fascist or a Bolshevik or any of these people because he's a propagandist. And likewise, if I set up a university. Uh, and I, it's true by my ownership, I can uh, again. Uh, I have a right 
to uh, reject anyone coming into the university. But a university, even its name, Universal University, suggests that anyone can go in to study at that place. Mm. And so it would be, it would be uh, the, the right of an eccentric owner of a university to reject, say, I don't know, say homosexuals from the university if, you, if, you, if you're so eccentric. However, it'd be mighty odd to have a university that didn't accept homosexuals or any other you know, group. You know, because a university is open almost in its principle mm. to uh, universally, to anyone. Yeah, and I think we should... Uh, and the propaganda should talk to anyone. Yeah, well, that's right. And I think that we should um, sort of contest that. In other words, we should, uh, you know, either ostracize or uh, condemn publicly and things like that. People would act in that way. So I would never go to a pub that would say, I don't accept this kind of people in the pub. And I think it should be, uh, you know, libertarians in, in particular who should say, I make a point of going to a pub um, which is open to everybody, and I make a point, uh, a point to not go to a pub that doesn't oh. allow... There, I think, there I think you're beginning on the political correct road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's right. It's, it's, it's that's the next one, I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, I wouldn't quite go uh, that, that far and, and say that uh, it should have a certain attitude. I, sh I, I certainly want to live in an open society in which there's a certain amount of tolerance. I wouldn't necessarily tolerate everyone. I mean, as soon as people become violent, for example. And oh, well, that's... And which people don't tolerate to, violence on principle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's <laughs> a, but what, what you're saying about universities is, is, uh, is interesting because I, I thought about this. Um, it's not just the ownership. It, it's a bit like, can a vegan shop sell meat? Uh, in principle, you could say, well, they are the shop owner. But if they explicitly put vegan shop at the front and then sell meat, it's a bit of a fraud if they sell meat, if they put vegan shop, it's a false kind of advertising. And if university starts radically censoring uh, opinions, and they're not the platform for opinions anymore, it, one could almost argue that that is, for that particular institution, almost almost like a fraud. It's almost like a vegan shop selling, selling meat. Yeah, that's right, I think that's right. They've got the right to do it, but it's highly eccentric yeah. and, and silly, <laughs> even. <laughs> I mean, Christian is right, they've got the right to do it, and we've got the right to criticise them. Mm. But whether we boycott them, uh, I think that boycotting is going towards the PC way, I feel. No, but, boycott is perfectly legitimate. Oh, it's legitimate, yeah, so. but it's going towards the PC, I think. Mm. Yeah. Legitimate, certainly. Um, in a, a sort of a similar way that people sometimes say, I'm not racist, but they say something overtly racist. Which of course they have a right to do. Yeah, uh, but they're incorrect. They, 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 uh, people <laughs> nowadays seem to say I'm not politically correct, but and then they say something overtly politically correct, uh, but without even fully realising it. Because when you look at the sort of thing that they say, where they they say well, well you've got to draw the line somewhere. You know, certain things people shouldn't be allowed to say, or if they are allowed to say them. If, we sh if they are allowed, they should be completely vilified by everybody. And this was heard this by the uh, comedian who wrote uh, the Titania McGrath column. Said, you know, some yes, okay, you should be allowed to, say, but you must be completely vilified if you say it. You know, possibly doxed. I don't know. Uh, so they they don't really want full free speech, and they say, and of course. You can't discriminate against people on the basis of race or sex when you're employing them. So they've given up freedom of speech, and they've given up freedom of association. Now, this is swallowing camels and straining at gnats. Basically, you've, you've, you've given up, you've given in to political correctness now, and you're just arguing about a few little details at the edges, and you think that you're not politically correct. And this is what I see time and time again by the critics of political correctness. Yeah, well, Douglas has got it as well. Yes, Douglas exactly. Yeah. He's got yeah. it. They've all got it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, you are one of the rare and noble exceptions who is genuinely not politically correct in any way. 
I'm afraid I dislike it. I'm almost <laughs> going, I dislike it so much. I said to uh, a letter to, to our friend Christian, I said, I confessed. And I thought, as soon as I said it, I thought, oh God. I said, I hate political correctness. So I'm, 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 for, I'm in danger of falling into a hate crime because <laughs> yes. I don't like political correctness. You're allowed to hate. You just mustn't assail your, uh, um, the uh, people you hate. Just so not you, physically. You must not. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, well, I mean, whether you write them or not, you're not allowed to. You to may attack them, them, condemn them. No, no, but you were saying to, to uh, what is it, to uh, wrongly gender somebody. I can't oh, can't, shock can't, horror. Is that, is, mis- well, you can certainly mis- be investigated gender. by the police for it. I don't know whether you can be actually be arrested for it at the moment. But that's the sort of thing that just saying something counts as a so called hate crime. It ought to be hatred, of course. Well, hatred is the noun, hate is the verb. I, I don't know why they can't even get that right. It's part of newspeak, is to simplify it, I suppose. Well, I certainly, I certainly wouldn't speak. physically attack someone who, who has political correctness. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, certainly not. So what the back? Yeah, um, the universities thing, um, is it the owners of the university that don't allow them to speak there? Or is it like a bullying group? Mm. Sways the owners of the university, they're not allowed to allow that. Person. I think it's fashion, it's, I think it's the new yeah, PC it's fashion. And fashion mm. and so, I want to join a group that has power to bully someone else to do something. I think that's where it cuts on this. Yeah, but the owners go along with it. I yeah. agree. They I, I, I think think out, really instead good of point. kicking out the yeah. bullies, they're kicking yeah. out the people who are being yeah, exactly. because the they've been bullied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I, I think the point made about being shot is really good. Um, but I, I think a lot of it, like the intensification of it. Is a lot to do with social media. I think that's why it's happening at the moment. Oh, it's far like, easier to yeah to yeah. bully someone when you can't see them. I think that's what it's about. Yep, yep, yep. There, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm just uh, um, thinking about what what John was saying. I I'm not sure if if I want to live in a society that has no taboos because I think. <laughs> Public discourse is not as ideal as like an intellectual setting is. You think there should be a taboo, a taboo against having no taboos? Do you? <laughs> huh? No, I, I think I think taboos are kind of a natural way of guiding uh, public debate. Some certain things that are that have already been settled are then triggering down to a common understanding. Certain things are not uh, are a bit naughty opinions to have, and and then people will naturally also say that. I don't think you can have ever. Can never have a society that has an ideal, uh, uh, completely free uh, discussion about everything, no matter mm. what the the topic is. You know, everything is on the tip. That's not how any society has ever worked, and I don't think it will ever work because most people are not interested in that. Most people want to have very clear taboos and very clear st- uh, strict things to, to to think about right and wrong. And 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 I think. Yes, and among certain groups of people, like intellectuals, universities, and so you need absolute f- uh, uh, free speech. Um, that's why it's, it's appalling that uh, universities start actually censoring people. But I think in the general public, you will always have taboos and certain uh, opinion that, do- that dominates. And if you don't go along with them, you will, you will be uh, a bit ostracized. That's, uh, that's <coughs> my memory, I think. I tend to think you, d- you did have, as I said earlier on, I tend to think that you did have basically free speech in the 1950s. Now, there might have been some sort of taboos, but they weren't felt all that much. They certainly weren't in de- in embraced by the state as, uh, as political correct p- taboos are, and enforced in every firm. I mean, just last week, the Johnson government said, you must have a minority person on every board in the country shortly. And that was just last Wednesday. Uh, you, you didn't have anything like that in, in to go. Uh, and the, the, the booze that were around in the 1950s, you could hardly see them. Uh, they, they were probably there, but I think they were probably local. They certainly weren't universal to booze. Uh, and most people didn't. See, most people aren't interested in discussion. So therefore, and they, I don't suppose they could, they don't, don't care what you want to talk about. You know, most people are just, in, and most people are different to how, you know, pe- people keep thinking that people are worried about other, other people's religion and so on and so forth. Uh, I've worked on a building site for years, I've never seen anyone fall out of a religion or ideology. I did see a number of people who were frightened of the Jehovah's Witnesses coming on the site preaching to them because they thought the Jehovah's Witnesses might convert them, so they were frightened. But basically, they any religion and so on in the uh, on the building society, they just they didn't they didn't know and they didn't care. 
Uh, political correctness, rather like the naming of the ministers in George Orwell's 1984, uh, does, it, they're all named, it, it, it's, it does, a, all of its ostensible aims are in fact undermined by what it really does. So it pretends it's in favour of diversity, and what it in fact seeks to do is enforce con total conformity of yes. view. Uh, it pretends it's seeking for social peace, and it in fact sets up social division. It pretends that it's um, in favour of liberalism, and it's in fact in favour of absolute authoritarianism. Uh, and it pretends it's trying to make predictable harmony, and in fact it's setting up uh, constant uh, self-interrogation, self-abnegation, uh, the words you can use, is it coloured one day, is it people of colour, is it coloured person? If you use the wrong one out of any of those things, and you're, you're immediately condemned. Well, the actor was, compliment to Yazgar in the book, uh, what's his name, the Sherlock Holmes chap? The, uh, com what's Benedict his name? Benedict is it? Benedict, Benedict come yeah. back. That's right. He had the. You know, he says coloured people. He says no, no. You shouldn't have said that. You should say people of colour. Of colour. <laughs> you should never say corduroy trousers. You should say trousers of corduroy. <laughs> yes, that's right. Otherwise, you're a fabricist. <laughs> we won't have any of that here because you've got to draw the line somewhere. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. No. Okay. More? No. no, no, no. One at the back. I just wanted to come on on that point as well. Is that in, in 1984, I think the thing, what you were just saying, people of colour versus coloured, or any of these kind of terms that flip day by day, one of the things mm. that Ms. Murray talks about is how that makes people lose their mind a little bit, because it's, mm. like, without knowing it, society starts to unravel, because you have to suddenly believe something that you, what was the, Freddie says you have to believe something is true today that wasn't true yesterday. Yes. And it's so 1984, it's just really summing it up in such a good way. Well, you have to affirm it. Overnight. It's so strange. Or appear to believe. Yeah, but I think he talks about how, with the queer thing, he starts yeah. to talk about how that's, queer is kind of undermining society and deconstructing society. I think he's trying, the point with not, like, changing what you believe in overnight, it's kind of trying to dismantle... Well, he has a look at the, the internet, doesn't he? He has, a, he has a chapter on the internet where he, uh, you know, Jermaine Vera wrote a book about 15 years ago, yes. and uh, at Cardiff University, where they invited him to speak, some uh, someone has, has got a hold of a book of 15 years ago and say, oh, well, 15 years ago she says this, that, and the other. That's now anti-trans. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and so she, with her platform winger, and moreover that, moreover, uh, she, she, uh, she's no longer a feminist. She no longer holds what feminists hold. And uh, so he's got her, and he's got two other examples. There's this chap, Peter Thrail, who was a homosexual, who happened to be a Republican. He said, well, this man attended, he even likes Donald Trump, he attended the Republican rally. Uh, homosexuals don't do that sort of thing, so therefore he's, <laughs> he's not an homosexual. <laughs> he seems to be a homosexual. And then he's got another person, Kanye West, uh, who uh, liked uh, Candice, uh, Candice, Candice Owens, and said, I like her. And then he, and she was really saying, well, look, there's... Uh, you know, blacks can have a, a victim mentality or a victim mentality. You know, they can be on top of things or they can be below. It's up to them. They ought to make a go of themselves. They ought to choose the victim mentality and not go victim mentality. And Kanye West said, that's wonderful. He says, that's beautiful. And uh, people didn't like her. They didn't like this particular black woman. It happened to be a black woman, this kind of so in. They didn't like her. And they didn't like... And then he said, I like Trump. I said, oh, you like Trump. Then you're not a black man. Not a black man. He's not a black man. See, not, not an homosexual, no, 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 not a black man, uh, not a, uh, you're a feminist. It's a, you're brilliant. There was, there was, a, there was a particularly uh, ludicrous, uh, she calls herself a professor of philosophy, whether she is or not, I don't know, called Rachel Maddow, who's also a cyclist. And she boasts that she's one of the main world championship women cyclists because, of course, she's in, in, a man. Uh, ah. But <laughs> so she, uh, uh, but uh, she she recently said that um, all sex and this is the idea now that it's now wrong to be gay or uh, lesbian. All sexuality other than pansexuality is immoral because it's wrong to discriminate based on genitalia. So she says that to be gay is immoral and to be straight is immoral. You've got to find everybody equally sexually attractive, otherwise you're discriminating, and that's immoral. And uh, she, I mean, if you see a picture of her, you 
It'd be hard. You can see, you can see, you can see why she's trying to coerce people into fancying her because <laughs> she's got blue hair for a start. You know? But uh, I've thought that, that um, I thought that the most hilarious was that I'm not only am I a philosopher, I'm a world world champion, world champion woman cyclist. <laughs> all these women's races I keep entering, I win them all. <laughs> It's because they're protesting, yeah, they're yeah, protesting yeah. this. It was hard for us to get these uh, these women braces and women tennis established, and now they have these men coming in. And, and you know, this is what Suzanne Moore says and Judy Birchall. You know, these men coming in and winning them now. Well, yeah, but the, ne the next level you'll be, you'll be able to self-identify as disabled and uh, enter the Paralympic uh, Games. What are disabled? <laughs> well, because they're the sex change operation. <laughs> Yeah, but you don't need the you don't need the operation anymore. This is this Just is take some drugs. This is the thing. You know, it used to be you had to have the operation. Now it's merely self 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 just just merely this pure assertion of it is enough. Yes. Um, but you have to be the right sort of person asserting that. You know, if you if you, if you say something silly, you hope we don't take you seriously. You say it, and Piers Morgan says, I you know, I assert, I, I identify as a penguin. He, 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 on his Twitter feed, he has a little picture of his head on a penguin. Body, you know. um, everybody's you know, it's just it's nonsense, but anybody else can just simply assert. But you can't, uh, as yet, at this point, assert whatever race you want to be. Uh, but I think it's. Uh, oh, you, well, he's got an example of because that, that lady, remember? Yeah. She had, had her hair yeah, fuzzy. Rachel, Rachel, and he's got that uh, Rachel. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, and he's got the, an example in the book, you know, she had, she turned out as a son turned out fizzy hair, you know. And uh, it's, it's passed some tests. Yeah, I, I was going to say, Dave, on a point you made about uh, the PC brigade, uh, you know, when they, they're put in there, uh, they, they have privilege. You mentioned that word, privilege. Um, I mean, the, that might be true, but when you look at, I mean, in the real world in which you live, where you have uh, established privilege and so forth, they just, you could argue that they just want to be competitors. And, uh, you know, if, if you're, uh, it's not a question of them being, um, the, the word, forget uh, the, the word you used. Um, um, I forget the word you used. Empowered. Uh, 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 yeah, that kind of thing. But they're trying to compete in a world of privileges. I mean, that's the real world in which we're in, not the theoretical uh, libertarian everyone is equal. No, uh, the libertarian world doesn't uh, assume that everyone's equal. On the contrary, the liberal, which libertarian is just a long word for liberal, is a world which tolerates differences, tolerates all sorts. Um, so it's not a pretending that everyone's... Now, when I say a privilege, I'm talking about the strict word of privilege, the pristine of a privilege in law. Now, this could be a handicap. Uh, Anthony Wedgwood Ben who was born uh, uh, into uh, the uh, aristocracy because uh, of his uh, father, uh, Ben, was uh, uh, Lord Ben. Now, he found that a handicap and got rid of it. So he got rid of it, he shed his privilege so he could, might one day become prime minister because uh, the fashion has changed. I mean, in the 19th century, a lord could become prime minister. Uh, but in the 20th century, it was getting, the, the, the fashion was such that it was getting harder. So Anthony Wedgwood Ben shed his privilege in law. Now, he shed his privilege, we're talking about an actual thing in law. Now, I'm saying that the laws against discrimination are de facto privilege. I'm not, I'm not talking about whether they make people better off or worse off. I'm saying that they are de facto privilege and they de facto underprivilege everyone else, if it's a freedom. Now, the jury... They're about equality, but but you're right. Privilege is not equality. Privilege is the opposite. Privilege means sums up. There's privilege, and there's, if you have any more privilege, then you must have the rest of society under privilege vis-a-vis -vis the privileged person. So therefore, if you say give the disabled uh, privileged parking spaces, everyone else in society who is not disabled are underprivileged. I.e., they've got to respect the parking spaces given to the disabled. That's real privilege. I'm not. It's not. It, it, it may or it may not help you to compete. Uh, that's neither here nor there. The privilege that I'm talking about is a definite thing in law. Uh, yeah. Whereas common sense, you know, talking about you know, liberalism or socialism, common sense will use privilege just to mean advantage. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
actually met him actually at Anthony Wakeley's bed in uh, foils when he had a book signing in. And he was sitting there on his own with his pipe. I had a good, good chat with him actually. Uh, but he gave it up after he'd taken advantage of it. And the reason he gave it up was again to take advantage of giving it up. Yes, of course. Yeah, gave up, I mean, gave uh, advantage of it to become Prime Minister. Uh, uh, I, I, can, I, can, I can see what you mean. I mean, you know, you get in a ridiculous situation with a PC brigade where, for example, it, just a very simple example I give you here, where the Irish Prime Minister, uh, uh, President, I believe, uh, Vadika, uh, who is a, a gay man with a partner, you know, presides over a country in which if a, an, a, an Irish peasant paid, uh, you know, five pounds to an Irish peasant lady for sex, he'd get arrested and put in jail. And yet the President himself is a homosexual with a partner. I mean, it's a bit bizarre, but uh, you know, you, know you, you can see a PC, PC ness in play there. I mean, he was very PC all his life, this chap, the brother car. Um, and yet, you know, when you look at the rules governing his subjects and his own, uh, and the laws which, which surround his own sexuality, you know, you can see how ridiculous the whole thing is. And, and then you, you, you transpond that to the whole country, and you think, oh, right. in Cincinnati, not just the South, but the North as well, thanks to Lord Morrow, uh, Lord Morrow, I might say, in the House of Lords, uh, you know, who passed the law in 2015, you know, along the same principles. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, you can see how ridiculous the whole PC uh, uh, bandwagon is. In, in, in that one. Well, it is incoherent. I mean, it's, it's, it's incoherent, uh, PC, because, because it, 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 it assumes, basically, first of all, it assumes uh, politeness and it's absolutely boisterous and impolite. You know, the PC people upset people rather than be polite to them. Yet they, they, under the guise of being polite. And or, secondly, it assumes that PC is establishing equality and it always establishes inequality. Yeah. So uh, there are two two contradictions, and there's a number of others which slip my mind there. But more important, hypocritical <laughs> rather uh, but, rather than just uh, uh, hypocritical. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's deliberately hypocritical, but obviously won't admit it. Well, some people are confused, aren't they? I mean, uh, some people probably don't see that uh, PC is really impolite, mm. but uh, so the, the, the propagandists like that. Terrible chap on uh, London uh, television, James O'Brien. He mm. must know that he's rude to people, mustn't he? <laughs> he can't be so silly that he doesn't realise he's being rude to people. Um, and yet he, he's a, and, uh, and and there must be something. No, he, he thinks he's vilifying people who deserve to be. Oh yes, that's right. He's being and rude that's to different people. from somebody who's being gratuitously rude. Oh. Anybody who said who, which, this is anybody who says something you shouldn't say about one of the favoured PC groups. So maybe you're right, he doesn't see it. I mean, he, he doesn't see the hypocrisy. He might not be able to see it, no. I mean, I suppose hypocrisy is... Uh, just before, I mean, all lying is hypocrisy because a liar pretends to be telling the truth. Uh, now, uh, as, uh, can people be unaware of hypocrisy? A liar like, may inadvertently tell the truth. Oh, liars can easily inadvertently tell the truth, yeah. That easy. He intends to lie. But he doesn't lie. Well, no, he does lie. No, no, he, he, he gives a... No, no, no a, lie, a lie. He declares in good, in apparently good faith, no. or even intentionally bad faith, but by chance, he happens to say a liar, something that is a the case. Can, somebody can go through their entire life, everything they say is a lie, and yet everything they say is true. Yes. Because so they always get it wrong. There's no lying is by yeah, by what by intentionality. It's That's not, right. It's not successful. It's like honesty. Uh, lie, the opposite of uh, you know the opposite of truth is falseness. The opposite of lying is being honest. Now we know everyone knows about the honest man. We know that he might get it wrong. However, uh, common sense is so pessimistic that they uh, that they think the liar gets it uh, get, gets it false every time. In other words, they confuse liars with false tellers. This is why the treating liar is no paradox at all. What you need in order to get the paradox home, is uh, the treating false teller or the treating true teller. The treating liar... On, on various websites... Lies, lies do not mean... Like most. Falsehood. People speak about someone's lying. 
No, no, they're entirely sincere. They're not bearing false. They confuse being true with yeah. bearing false witness. Yes, mm. they're not they bearing do. false witness. Yeah. They're saying what they sincerely believe. That's right. Yes, and it's false. Yes, mm. most 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 propagandists believe what they say. Or even I believe what I say. <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> yeah, people do because it, it, you see the point is that it, there's an asymmetry between lying and honesty. Honesty is cheap. Lying is very, very expensive indeed, uh, because if I lie, I've got to nurse that lie and take take care of it. Being honest, I just let it take care of itself. Mm. You know, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 and and if I'm wrong, well, it doesn't matter. Whereas if I've told a lie and I get found out, then it does matter. Well, it's, it's like that that Labour politician in the election, John Ashworth, who he, who said <laughs> oh, that yeah. he, he thought that the Labour Party was going to lose the election because Jeremy Corbyn was going down like a of cold sick on the doorstep yes and, and and obviously he was he was lying for a joke but in fact he was right yes <laughs> <laughs> absolutely right yeah spot on yeah couldn't be uh, couldn't be more spot on yeah trying to mislead your colleague <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the poor old corbyn <laughs> yeah. poor old corbyn didn't stand the slightest chance uh the the 2017 election was a one horse race the last election in 2019 <laughs> was also a one-horse race. There could only be a Hong Parliament or a Tory win. No chance whatsoever of a Labour win, no. yet the media don't like that. The media always pretend that the second party is a contender. But the second party well, has not a, been a contender well, since contender. 2010. And what's, what's taken them out of contention is the loss of Scotland to the SDP, uh, SNP. They've lost Scotland, so they've ceased to be contenders. They might as well stop at home. Uh, they're at least ten years, ten years away from power. It's going to take them more than one. Other. If they don't get back Scotland, they might as well close down the Labour Party. It, it, it wasn't possible there's one for Labour to win outright. Sorry. That's sorry. It wasn't possible for the Labour to win outright. But if the Conservatives didn't get an overall majority, the SNP could have propped up a Corbynite uh, yes. prime ministership, and who knows what damage he could have wrecked. That's a, that's a bit like. That's a bit like that's a bit like a, uh, a uh, an agreement between the Conservatives and the Labour, because the SNP, remember, in Scotland, are the actual dire enemies of Labour. It's going to be very hard to get a, a, a compact between the SNP and Labour. Very hard. As hard as getting one with the Conservative it, no, Party. It just cost, uh, but of course, in the war, you did get the Conservative and Labour together. Yeah, do it for a referendum. referendum. Yeah. They might do it for yeah. The Scottish Labour Party will do it, but will the yes. Labour Party do it? Oh well. Yeah, the, the Scottish they, National they, Party will do they, it. They, they're not dead set against a referendum either. On what topic? <laughs> Scotland break away. Scottish independence. But if, if Scotland break away, that'll mean that they certainly won't get Scotland back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but they'll have power for one election so for, 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 for a five-year period. No. <laughs> <laughs> they they'll have a swan song. Oh, you mean they'll have a co they'll be in a coalition? Well, you know, you, yeah, but but Corbyn and his market shouldn't they need to get their foot in the door, and then uh, like uh, in Venezuela, or whatever, and then they're passing all kinds of enabling acts uh, to keep them there forever. Mm. I'm the sure there was not the back there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I just wanted to raise the point. So at the start of the Douglas Murray book, he actually he highlight. I think you mentioned at the start. He said, it, like Marxism used to cover um, the working classes, the struggle against the hierarchies that they need to deconstruct. Um, and I think there's quite an interesting parallel with what's happened to the Labour Party now. You go back 50 years, they were very much the party of working people. But now they've really flipped, adopt this political credits agenda. The leadership of, yeah. Kind of a, a London, you know, the classic London Liberal League kind of uh, view of who needs supporting the current uh, society that we have. And that's when they've abandoned the kind of working classes who are the North of England or whatever you want to call it. And I think that's very much what happened in that election. That the North disappeared for, for Labour because they just weren't talking to them anymore. They were talking about political correctness. Well, they went against Brexit, that's the thing. Well, that too. That's yeah, that was a big thing. <laughs> and, an but but what, what you got on television, I don't know whether you saw them after I them on television last Sunday, but you got the, the candidate for the Labour leader, the double name uh, lady, Long, Rebecca Long Bailey. Long Bailey. <laughs> uh, you got her saying that she'll expel anyone in the Labour Party who she f sort of finds. Uh, uh, breaking political correctness on any line whatsoever. So basically, she's abandoned the Labour Party for a political correct ideology of her own. And she's going to expel anyone. Well, how many people is she going to expel? It's the new power struggle, isn't it? They've, they've kind of they've decided the working classes weren't good enough to have a revolution. So now Marxism has moved over to anything else they can find. And this is what Douglas Murray talked about at the start. 
anybody else they can find who needs somehow to deconstruct the system. Except that it isn't, uh, see, so I mean, it's, it's wrong to, I mean, the two things of, of Moria and other people, one, they say it's liberal, and it's not liberal, although, you know, with the caveat that Paul said that you can have liberals uh, floating, like any of all these words are capable of ambiguity and uh, floating, different usage. But political correctness is not liberal, and it's most certainly not Marxist, it's anti-Marxist. I mean, what you got then in 1969 is the Marxism today, calling itself Marxism today, should have called itself PC tomorrow, I suppose, or something, but he anyway, called itself Marxism today. <laughs> And it was dead against the Morning Star. We were the old Bolsheviks. You know, now Bolsheviks. Are you talking about living Marxism or Marxism today? Because they're, they're different publications. Uh, Marxism today is the Communist Party publication. Yeah, Marxism. Living Marxism is the, the what I used to call the Roman Catholic Party, oh, the Revolutionary Communist yeah, Party. Right. Yes, and it was right. back the IRA, yeah. Oh, then right. spiked, yeah. Oh, uh, right. The Roman Catholic Party, and now spiked. And, and, they, and very sensible. They were all, all yeah, in the Brexit good. party. Well, <laughs> well, they, they, well, they always, they, they always, call themselves libertarian. they always, they, they always, <laughs> and they partly are. <laughs> they always, they always did have a high opinion of themselves. And uh, I read their literature around about 1980 or thereabouts, and it was uh, pretty good. Uh, I mean, it was wrong at it, but it was wrong in an interesting way. And they had a, a man who took the uh, name Frank Richards, who used to write for them. Back then, his stuff was pretty good back then. But they're basically a violent and thuggish party. And at one at university, they used to go around trying to seek out racialists to beat them up. And they beat a few people up at one at university. They're a thuggish gang. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so they're the most thuggish gang of all those parties. I, I never saw another. Even the uh, IS or the WSP didn't actually uh, organise a gang of thugs to go around and seek out to beat people up and beat them up. Um, so, uh, no, so they're the worst in, in a sense. They're good, pretty good literature. Worth doesn't mean reading. their argument was wrong. No, that's true. It doesn't. Uh, I'm not talking about their argument. I'm talking about their immorality. Uh, the, uh, and they, and they, uh, you know, I think they're they're illiberal to beat, and they're illiberal to support the IRA as well. They're liberal to beat people up. Um, so I'm talking about immorality. Uh, but they, they've now, they are now in spite, but no, I don't mean that. I mean, Marston today, which is the Communist Party, Communist Party of Great Britain. From the Young Communist League, they were, and they were against the older Communist Party. That's one of the... Mar so, Morning Star. Yeah, so I will drift a little bit. Uh, so we talked a lot about the, the gender and sexual orientation, uh, etc. And I think uh, all of that, in fact, is... Uh, not particular cases, but like the extreme, the extreme case of the, the whole thing that uh, we apparently we the, the elephant in the room that we completely dismiss, which is uh, gynocentrism. We, we don't talk about this. Which is what gynocentrism. What's that? Uh, gyno. Gyno. As in female. Fe yeah. Female. And the opposite. That the, the society is uh, is now. Uh, centered around all the uh, f feminine values and we, we indoctrinate everyone to, to abide by those uh, f feminine values and that's a way for, for all of us to, to comply to what they want to, the establishment want, want to impose. And th thus this uh, po political correctness is made uh, possible with, by that influence on people this, uh, this gynocentrism, which, which is like the, you can see it as the, uh, the emerged part, part of the iceberg, where the, 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 the part above the sea would be the f feminism. Mm -hmm. And we, we, would be, uh, uh, we would be surprised that uh, probably all of, all of us here in the, in the room uh, have been affected by this, uh, this indoctrination, and it, because that thing, uh, through generation and generation, that thing uh, runs deep. And we, for, for, for most of the time, we don't uh, we don't see it until uh, until uh, we are. Do you have any examples uh, when you say we've all been affected by it? Uh, like uh, the, the the mother with their, their sons, uh, the mother, mothers uh, most of them lies lie to their son about what what a man should be and how he should uh, behave to to, to the, the woman. The, most women t today tell exactly the opposite of what uh, the, the, 
the son, the man should, should know about women. They tell exactly the opposite. They tell, uh, don't be like your father, don't be like uh, the, this man, this man, be, uh, be like this, be like that, be a good guy. And Are you saying be a feminist? Yes, more and yeah, more. Yeah, no, it's feminists and politically correct mothers do, but most mothers are not. Yeah, like most mothers are. Don't be a big baby. Yeah, they, yeah. Don't, they, they will distinguish. Yeah. They know boys are boys will be boys, and they're different from girls, and they accept it, and they don't try and impose anything on them that's egalitarian. Maybe it's not yeah, Molly, Molly cites uh, you know, the as the yeah. women in Britain who classify themselves as feminists. Mm. And he says nine percent. Yeah. There's thirty-two percent in. In the USA, but there's nine percent in Britain. Yeah. Or tomorrow. What was those figures again? Nine percent of women in Britain classify themselves as feminists. And in the USA, thirty-two. And then it's an overwhelming majority that want equality of the sexes, but they refuse to call themselves feminists. Mm. And that's, mm. I think that's quite interesting. Mm. They're sort of doing themselves a disservice with the actions they take. I, I, uh, uh, there was uh, before that. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm just an first of all, just an observation on, on the state of debate in the Labour Party, um, which I, it didn't get much coverage today. But uh, Dawn Butler, who's one of the one of the candidates for the deputy leadership, was arguing on breakfast television this morning about the trans, the called transsexual trans issue now, yeah. and uh, with Richard Madeley, so you can imagine what it was like. Um, but she ended up saying, because he was saying, well, you know, if you, but what if you're, you, know, you can you just assert that you're something other than the sex you were, you were born as? She said, but nobody's born as any sex. Yeah. She, 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 her, her view, which she articulated, was that you have no sex at all when you're born until you grow up and choose your sex. That's right. Was the actual view she was that, that, articulating. That's, that's, that's astonishing. That's, it, yeah, well, it is mad, yeah. But, but in terms of the prevalence of PC, I mean, I, in the office I work in, which is a lot of people in it, and I sit next to a long table full of a lot of uh, black people, and I think minorities uh, doing a particular kind of work, and I hear them talking and chatting, and d during the whole Megxit debate when Meghan uh, and Harry up sticks and got to Canada, uh, and the the um, the media was all going on about how she must have left because of the racial abuse she must have been getting. The, the sheer horror of the racial abuse she's getting <laughs> drove her out of the country. You know, there obviously were no any other benefits. You know, all the palace and things. You know. the, the, she, the fact that some newspapers might have said the other disobliging thing drove her out of the country. Now I was listening to them chatting about Megxit. They were talking a lot about it, and what they were all saying was. That baby Archie, when he grows up, he's gonna hate his mother because he could have been royal, and they've fucking robbed, they've fucking robbed it of him. They've robbed him of his royal heritage. He could have been royal, that poor lad. He's gonna hate his parents because he's gonna be some American kid. He could have been royal. That's that's the view that they all had. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think that will make any difference, will it, to to to, to uh, the line. <laughs> Succession. No, it doesn't make it, as Dave said, it's, it's the privilege of things. He's, he's going to be the title if, he, mm. if they kept him yeah. as active royals. Well, they could have chosen he's less likely to have a title. Yeah. yeah. I think the official part can now be concluded. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, David. Now we'll carry on. <laughs> but thank you, David, for your interesting. Thank you for